Our next two videos are going to look at the periodic table and certain properties that are seen repeating themselves within the periodic table. Today is periodic properties one and we'll look at the properties of atomic radius and ionization energy. A few review terms uh, for the periodic table that we need to make sure we're clear with. Um, first of all, periods. There are seven periods. Periods are horizontal ro rows. So we have period one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and these two are on period six and seven as well. Groups or families. There are 18 of these. Groups or families are going to be vertical columns. So we have one, two, three, all the way out to 18. We also have blocks um, based upon the ending electron configuration for the elements in the region. Uh, first of all is this block, which is called the S block. We have this section between the S block and the next one over through here, which is 10 wide. This is the D block. This is the P block and this is the F block of the periodic table. We have, within the table, we have certain uh, areas that contain metals. That's actually the majority of the elements. So the metals would be, let me change colors on my ink. We have the elements, well, that didn't help any. So the elements that go through here and then follow the zigzag and then all of these down here as well. So we have metals all the way over to here, over to here. And then all these down here are metals also. Our non-metals are over here. And then our metalloids are the zone in between uh, that contain boron, silicon, germanium, arsenic, antimony, tellurium, polonium. Uh, these would all be the the transition zone between metals to the left and non-metals to the right. Now let's look at some properties, periodic properties of the periodic table. The properties of elements vary in a regular way in, uh, as we look th at these properties properties of the elements vary in a regular way as we examine them in the context of the periodic table. The periodic law states that the properties of the elements are periodic functions of their atomic numbers. Periodic just means repeating. So these are repeating properties um, that vary according to their atomic numbers. Okay. And one of the reasons why we get these repeating uh, properties based upon atomic numbers is that the atomic number, which is the number of protons, most importantly equals the number of electrons. And electrons um, control uh, the majority of the properties of the, the atoms uh, that we will be looking at. And our first of these varies in a regular way is the atomic radius. Uh, one way of looking at atomic radius is just simply atomic size. So when we look at the atomic radius of an atom and we say that it has a certain value, we're actually stating something about the, uh, the size of the atom. The formal definition is one half the distance between the nuclei of identical atoms joined together to make a molecule. When we look at this diagrammatically, we have uh, two atoms joined together in a molecule. Their electron clouds uh, deform at the point of, uh, of junction where the bond is forming 
we have a nucleus here, we have a nucleus here, and we would have the distance to where the electron clouds are deformed. So this is called the covalent radius. This is one type of atomic radius, and it's the type we'll, t we'll typically tend to use. The internuclear distance would be from here to here, from nucleus to nucleus. So this 133 picometers uh, is the covalent radius, is one half the internuclear distance. But notice that this would be different than if we just looked at the distance from here to here or here to here because of the, de the deformation of the electron cloud. When we look at the pattern, what we see is a regular repeating pattern. We've got, this is uh, family number uh, one, which would be lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, and cesium. Hydrogen doesn't seem to be included in this particular um, graphic. We've got family um, 17 here with fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. And then we look at the pattern from lithium to fluorine. So this would be, uh, if we're looking at lithium to fluorine, this would be period two, this would be period three, period four, period five. Okay, so you can see that there is definitely a pattern. We can also see that there's a pattern if we were to look at just uh, the members of family number one, lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, and cesium, we can see that there's a gradual increase. We've got fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, gradual increase. We can do that with any of the elements that we connect together. Uh, but mainly what we're going to be looking at when we look at these patterns is from left to right in the periodic table and then from top to bottom in the periodic table, overall trends. So let's start with the trend explanation of the periods, seven periods for atomic radius. Okay. Trend explanation, period trend. Okay, we're going to look at period and group trends. So what happens to the energy level as you add electrons across a period? So as we go from lithium to fluorine, for instance. We're adding electrons here to 2s. By the time we get over here, we're in 2p. But the important thing is that we're in period 2. So if we're in period 2, that means we're in energy level 2. So what happens to the energy level as you add electrons across a period? The answer is that it remains constant. Or, if we're down in period four and we've got uh, potassium on the left and we've got krypton on the right, and then here in the middle we've got something like iron, then we're looking at potassium being in 4s, then iron is in 3d, and um, krypton is back to 4p. So in this case, it goes from energy level 4 down to 3 and back up to 4. So we can say remains constant or decreases. Okay. Second question is what happens to nuclear charge as we move across a period? Nuclear charge, as we move across a period, always increases. It gets higher and higher because each element to the right of the one before it is going to have at least, it will have one more uh, proton, which means its nuclear charge is going to increase by one. So here's our scenario. We've got um, to explain how, how this, these two facts produce the period trend. By the way, the period trend was that, if we go back over here, the period trend is that as we move across the period, we get, in general, a decrease in atomic size. So the period trend that we're explaining 
size decreases from left to right. Okay, keep that in mind. We have a law in physics that deals with how electrical, uh, electrically charged objects attract one another. It's known as Coulomb's law. Coulomb's law says the force of attraction and repulsion, attraction or repulsion, between two charged objects is directly proportional to the product of their charges and inversely to the, proportional to the square of the distance between the charges. That's a mouthful. So when we look at that from an equation viewpoint, what we find is that, let me do a little erasing, erasing here. So here we'd say that the force, we're talking about electrons and protons. Force, so this would be a force of attraction. Is equal to a constant, which we're not going to actually do any calculations, so the constant doesn't matter. Um, multiplied by the charge of the first particle, the charge of the second particle. The charge of the first particle is going to be the nucleus and its charge. The second object is going to be the electron cloud and it's negative so our positive nucleus and our negative electron cloud we're thinking of the electron cloud as a particle and the nucleus as a particle this value d squared this is the distance between q1 and q2 Okay. So what this equation says is what we have over here on the right. This is the verbal statement of this particular equation. This is Coulomb's law. So what this means is that if we have an increased value of Q1, Q2, or both, since Q1 times Q2 is a, a multiplication, if we keep the distance the same, force is going to increase. If, on the other hand, we increase the distance while keeping Q1 and Q2 the same, we're dividing by a larger number and force is going to decrease. So when we say inversely proportional to the product of the charges, uh, excuse me, directly proportional to the product of the charges, inversely proportional to the distance between them, we're saying direct proportion. If we increase these two, then force is going to increase as well. Inverse proportion with distance. If we increase distance, we're going to decrease force. Uh, this does a lot to explain um, the actual properties that we're referring to. So applying this to, let's just use the second period. This has lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and neon. If we look at the number of protons, this is 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. If we look at the number of electrons, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. But the important thing is where are these? Okay. Our protons are in the nucleus, so they're at a fixed location. Our electrons are located um, in energy level 2. So what we essentially have, if, if we didn't allow the, the uh, electron cloud to shrink or get larger, we could say that we're at a sort of a fixed distance here for energy level two. We're adding electrons to the same location each time, as compared as composed to the, as compared to the nucleus. So when we look at this, what are we doing to our number of positives? We're increasing our number of positives with each atom to the right. We're increasing our number of negatives with each atom to the right, but we're adding them all to energy level two. So the end result is that if we look at the force. This value up here is getting larger, 
whereas this value down here is remaining the same, not, not increasing or decreasing, so the value of the force of attraction is larger. So strong attraction on this side Weak attraction here. So these atoms end up being big, whereas these end up being small. The trend explanation here, our trend with groups, the group trend is that um, we increase size top to bottom in periodic table. So as we move from the top to the bottom of a family, atomic size tends to increase. So let's think about why. What happens to the energy level as we move from top to bottom in the table? Well, if we're on period 1, we're in energy level 1. If we're in period 7, we're in energy level 7. So from top to bottom, energy level increases. This is the same thing as saying distance increases between the, the nucleus and the outer edge of the electron cloud. What happens to the distance of the outer electrons from the nucleus? There's an increase. And we also have an effect known as the shielding effect uh, due to core electrons. So with the shielding effect, what we have is core electrons block the effect of nucleus on valence electrons. So the more core electrons we have, which would be in the larger atoms toward the bottom of the table, the less effect the nucleus has on the valence electrons. So you get an even, um, even more of a spread out of uh, atoms potentially because of the shielding effect than you would have otherwise. Okay, so two things, distance increases and we have shielding effect. Both of these cause larger atoms at bottom of table. Let's move on to ionization energy. Ionization energy is the energy that's required to remove an electron from an atom to make an ion. We have two different ways that we can make ions. First of all, we have oxidation, um, and that's actually what we're looking at here with ionization energy is oxidation. That is specifically the removal of an electron from an atom. That always produces cations. Remember, cations are positive ions. And we have successive ionization energies. So if we remove the first um, electron, we've had to use the first ionization energy. The energy required to remove the second electron is the second ionization energy, and third, and fourth, and so forth. All right, so how is ionization energy related to strength of attraction of an atom for its outer electrons? First of all, it's important to to recognize that when the ionization energy removes an electron, it removes outermost or the valence electrons. And it's sort of in the reverse of the way we fill up an atom, which is the off bow principle. So the reverse of the off bow. So if we're asking how is ionization related to strength of attraction, the electrons that are the farthest away from the nucleus are the ones that are 
least strongly held onto by the uh, by the nucleus because it's far the, the electrons are farther away. So ionization energy is related to strength of attraction uh, directly. Um, the hot, greater attraction equals higher ionization energy. I'm using IE to represent ionization energy. How does this relate to atomic size? Well, little atoms have strong attraction. For electrons, okay, because of the distance factor in Coulomb's law. Distance is small, force of attraction is high. So what we end up with when we look at all this, when we put the, this, these ideas into a graph, little atoms, small atoms, have great attraction Great attraction has higher ionization energy, so we can say that small, small atoms have high ionization energies. So we would find the highest ionization energies where we have the smallest atoms, which would be the top right. And we would have the lowest ionization energies where we have big atoms. Which would be bottom left of the table. So if we look at this graphically, we can see that if we start with hydrogen here and we go to helium, this is the first ionization energy in kilojoules per mole of atoms. This is the atomic number. So as we work through period one, from here to here, we have an increase in ionization energy. Helium has a greater ionization energy than hydrogen. Then as we move back to lithium across the table, we end up having a, uh, a lower ion first ionization energy. As we move back across from left to right to neon, we end up with a high ionization energy. So what we find in our trend is sort of the opposite of what we had for atomic radius. We get a, um, an increase ionization energy left to right. Okay. We can also look at um, another trend would be the, um, the family trends. So for instance, if we connect lithium to sodium, to potassium, to rubidium, to cesium, to francium, the gradual decrease from top to bottom. And again, you can see it maybe a little more clearly with the, the noble gases as we look at size. Um, these bigger atoms that we're getting to now Radon would be the next one, not mercury. So we've got the noble gases. We start with little atom has high ionization energy. The biggest atom has the lowest ionization energy. We can also look at this in a three-dimensional way by looking at hydrogen to helium. Then we come back to this side. We've got lithium. Gradual increase as we step back across to the next noble gas. When we go to a noble gas, back to uh, an, alkaline me an alkali metal, uh, we find that we get a decrease in ionization energy followed by a stepwise increase as we move across the table. Okay, so the period trend explanation. Um, explain using Coulomb's law. Force of attraction, highest where distance is smallest.
and the distance would represent from the nucleus to the outer edge of the electron cloud. Uh, we tend to find these uh, to the far right of the table. Okay. We also can say that force of attraction highest where Q1, Q2 is highest, which is also on the right, okay, on the period. So both of these factors uh, tend to play into making um, ionization energy very high on the right. Um, small atoms equals high ionization energy. And that's when we say ionization energy, we're referring primarily to first ionization energy. Group trends are the opposite. Big atoms at bottom. So we tend to find a, a decrease because big atoms have low ionization energies. So we tend, tend to find that as our, our atoms get bigger, our ionization, atoms, our ionization energies get lower, and that would be at the bottom of the table. So our trend is this. If we've got, um, let's, to, let's use this to represent our periodic table. We have, as we move down the table, we have a decrease in ionization energy. As we move from left to right, we have an increase in ionization energy. That means for atoms over here, like fluorine, it's more difficult to remove an electron from an atom of fluorine than it is from an atom of lithium over on this side. It's more difficult to remove an electron from an atom of lithium than it is an atom of francium down at the bottom, the bigger atom. So it takes more energy to take it away, so therefore it's more difficult. One more graphic here. Um, looking at successive ionization energies. When you look at lithium, you see that this, this is actually looking at, uh, this would be a first ionization energy, second ionization, third ionization, fourth ionization, and fifth. So this is the energy to take away um, successive electrons from one another. So for lithium, to take the first electron away takes 520 kilojoules per mole, 7,298 to take the second electron away, and 11,815 to take the third electron away. You see that trend in all of them. So one trend that we can see in this graphic is that as we work our way to higher ionization energies, more electrons being taken away, um, it takes more energy. Okay, So each successive ionization energy requires more energy. And I should actually say here, each successive ionization. And the reason for that is that every time you take an electron away, like if you've got lithium, which has three protons and three electrons, if we take away, if, if we have a certain size here between the three proton atom and three electron atom, if we take an electron away to have three protons and only two electrons, the three protons have a greater attraction for the two electrons, and this ends up being smaller. So to take the next electron away is going to require more energy because it's taking it from a smaller atom that holds on to its electrons more tightly. So in general, in fact, this you can see this with all of them, each electron you take away requires more energy for the, for the next electron to be removed. There's another pattern that shows up, and this is highlighted uh, with these in red. Um, the second ionization energy 
requires 7,298 for lithium. The third, you're jumping from 1,757 to 14,000. Uh, on this one, the fourth, there's a big leap between the third and the fourth, 3,600 to 25,000. And then on carbon, we've got 6,200 for the fourth, but the fifth jumps way up to 37,830. Uh, this needs explaining also. Um, why is there the big leap, the big increase uh, in ionization energy as we go between certain locations? And the answer to that is that think about what happens. If this one, if we've got lithium, so let's actually, let me erase and get a little bit of room here. If we look at lithium's electron configuration, and let's do this as an abbreviated electron configuration because that will show it more clearly. Lithium's abbreviated electron config configuration, Li, is going to be uh, neon, oh, excuse me, that's helium. Let's start over. Helium 2s1. Beryllium is going to be helium 2s2. And let's just do boron. Boron is going to be helium 2s2, 2p1. Okay. So let's take away some electrons. If we have lithium, we take away one electron. That electron is going to come from the highest occupied energy level which is energy level 2, and there's only one electron there. We take that electron away, we now have the core configuration, which is the same as helium. Okay. With beryllium, we take away one electron. 900 kilojoules required. That takes away one electron. We've got one left in 2s. Second electron we take away, 1,757. Take away that. When we take away that, We've lost 2s, and we have helium's configuration. If you look at boron, first electron to be removed, 801. Take that away. 2,427. Drop that to 1. 3,660. We take away the next electron. So we've taken away the three valence electrons, and we're back to helium's configuration. So with each of these areas where we have the big leap in electron, well, big leap in ionization energy, we would say that the valence electrons have been removed. And that's one thing. We drop an energy level. So we've dropped, for instance, with lithium, we've dropped, um, when we lose that first electron, we've dropped from energy level 2 back to energy level 1 in helium's configuration. And also important, we attain an electron configuration equivalent to a noble gas. And that electron configuration is very stable. So this explains the energy changes, but it also allows you to make some predictions. The prediction that it allows you to make is it allows you to predict the most common ion that will form. When we look at something like aluminum, for instance, our first three ionization energies are relatively low compared to this one. These three are likely to be lost. So if we lose three electrons, they're taken away. That's going to give this a plus three charge. When we look at magnesium, 
we could see that uh, it takes uh, two electrons, first two to be removed are relatively low in energy, so they're likely to be lost. This one's not as likely. Magnesium is going to tend to form a positive two charge. Lithium. We're going to lose one electron, then we have a big jump. That goes positive one charge. So this allows you to see what atoms are going to have a tendency to do. They're going to tend to lose electrons if they happen to be losers. They're going to tend to lose electrons until they reach a stable noble gas arrangement. Okay, so generally what you would do is if you look at a periodic table, which I can do by going all the way back to the beginning, when we look at a periodic table and we say what's the most likely ion to form uh, of calcium? So we're looking at calcium right here. Well, we're going to lose one electron, lose two electrons before we develop a configuration of argon. So our most likely charge would be positive two. We lose two electrons. If we're looking at something like germanium, uh, let's don't do that one, that's a little more complex. If we look at silicon here, we're going to lose one, lose two, lose three, lose four if silicon is losing. And we would expect to lose those four before we end up with neon's configuration. That would give it a plus four charge. If we look at something like cesium, cesium has to back up one, lose one electron, and then it develops this configuration, xenon's configuration. This is likely to be a plus one charge. So it allows you to make predictions. It's not always... Uh, going to give you every scenario that could exist, but it would give you the scenario for the most likely charge for an atom. This concludes the uh, first video for the periodic table.